I spent two years as a broadcast video guy and I wanna share some of the things I learned and you may be surprised at how much that benefited me when it comes to using Ableton Live and running tracks on stage. Hey everyone, and welcome back to Behind the Space Where This is the podcast covering video guys, but for people that use Ableton Live on stage, if that's you, you're in the right place. Um, now, I teased up at the front. Uh, this is an episode I still think you should watch, even if you have nothing to do with video, if you've never done live streaming or broadcast video before, um, because one of the things I'm gonna share that I learned is how much you can learn about stepping into someone else's shoes. So as I teased at the beginning, I spent about two years in Austin, Texas, as I'm calling it the video guy, but I think technically my title is like manager of video or whatever, uh, working for my church in Austin, Texas. And this role kind of came about because of COVID as a lot of people's roles shifted and changed during COVID, particularly those that worked at a church. Um, I initially was a front of house audio guy there and did that for about a year and a half, which was a fun challenge and was really enjoyable for me. And then COVID hit and our church had never done a broadcast in the, the history of the church existing. That was an intentional decision, not because they're behind the times, but they intentionally decided to do that. Uh, and, um, and COVID hit and they went, we need a way to broadcast services out to people. Um, so we wanna start doing that. And so I was a part of a conversation. Here's maybe tip number one or, or thing I learned that actually wasn't on the list. That's a part of the story. So I remember being on a conversation with my boss and uh, my boss's boss. And my boss's boss was saying, Chris was saying, man, I'm just losing sleep over how we're going to do this broadcast thing. We have no one on our team that has experience. We have no one that knows this world, that knows the gear. I don't know what we're going to do. You know, it's COVID. How are you going to hire someone? And we need to get this up and running in a month. Like the, you know, the church kind of said in a month, we're going to start doing this. And I had this moment where I kind of felt like the tap on the shoulder that's like, say something, speak up. And in that moment, I realized there's two paths I could take here. I can take the path of least resistance. I can take the path that's easiest. Just keep my mouth shut, keep with my job as, as is, and just roll with that. Or I could take the path where I can say, hey, um, you know, I've never actually done broadcast video, but I do a lot of live streaming for my company from studio to stage. Uh, I did a lot of live streaming at the last company that I worked for. I built our live streaming studio that I believe they still have pieces of that, that they still use today. Uh, produced a lot of video content for from studio stage as well as uh, uh, the previous company I worked for and a church that I worked for in Florida. I, I was the creative director. I went through a lot of titles, but one of the roles there was interfacing with our broadcast team. So I'm used to that environment. I'm comfortable in that environment. It doesn't scare me. And in that moment, I'm going, which of these paths do I take? Because this one is gonna be really easy. It's gonna be really comfortable. This one is gonna mean more work, a lot of work like it, you know, in the middle of uh, this pandemic that no one really knew what was happening. Um, it's gonna be a lot harder. And I chose that second path. So I think there's always, um, don't be afraid to challenge yourself. Like that's something I learned from that. Um, I learned particularly for me, and this is one of the points on here, uh, I get bored really easily. And so I had a lot of fun doing something completely different than what I do for my day job. My day job is teaching people how to use Ableton Live. You would think broadcast video guy, you couldn't be any more different than that. But in fact, there are a lot of similarities to what I'm doing. And so much that I learned through that experience of doing broadcast uh, it helped me improve what I'm doing. Uh, and so I'll walk through some of those. So I did that for about two years and then um, just a lot of different seasons coming to an end for my family and I, and we decided to move from Austin, which meant I couldn't do that job remotely. Uh, and so, uh, left that job, left the church there. Great, great people that I love. That's, uh, one of the few jobs I've left and like love the people that I worked with and still on really good terms. And I don't know how much that says about me versus the previous places I used to work at, but it's the truth. Um, and, and had so much fun, but, um, I'm prepping titles and prepping shows. And I went, man, this is something I've thought about doing. And I don't want to pass this by because I don't want to, uh, miss celebrating that season. It's another, um, thing I learned from that or tip or whatever kind of, we can pull out of this is celebrate previous seasons you've had. You know, we're coming out of COVID. A lot of you watching this as artists or playback techs or whatever, um, either we're completely out of work or shifted to completely different types of work. Um, maybe you're back into playback. Maybe playback was a thing you did in the past and you just enjoy listening to this podcast uh, and you've moved on to something else. None of that is wrong. None of that, like you didn't waste time. Celebrate that season. Um, I don't know that I'll ever go back and do broadcast video again. 
I'm, I'm incredibly proud of the skill set that I developed and gained some new skills during that, that period. Uh, I feel confident that if uh, the proverbial doo-doo were to hit the fan with From Studio to Stage and every single person um, um, canceled their From Studio to Stage account and people stopped buying products and YouTube shut my channel down, um, that I could go get a job as a video guy somewhere, right? And I hate using the term video guy, but I don't know what else to call it. It's better than calling myself a video. And if you've been around video guys, you know that term is unfortunately used uh, a little too often. But um, I, 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 I wanna celebrate that season. And so that's kind of what this episode is. If no one listens to it, it's more for me just to look back and go, this is a, um, uh, I'll use a church term, Ebenezer for me to look back and remember what that season was like. Okay, so let's get into some practical things. Uh, number one, I learned it's all signal flow. Whether you're talking video, whether you're talking audio, whether you're talking IT within reason, it's all signal flow. And if you have experience in a studio, designing a studio, understanding how a patch bay works, if you understand signal flow, which I think is one of the most important skills for anyone in a live show, live production environment, um, if you have experience doing that, you can apply that in many different disciplines, video, audio, uh, there was a guy that I worked with there, Ryan, really, really great audio guy. And we would often talk about uh, video and signal flow things. And, and we just kind of joke that it's like, again, if you understand basic signal flow from an audio perspective and how audio gets from a mic to a front of house console, particularly when you get into networked audio, those sorts of things. If you understand patch bays, matrix mixing, those sorts of things, you'll get video and you'll understand a video system and how it works and how to design it the right way not in a way that has a lot of dependencies where things could fail. Um, number two, building rigs video systems is really, really, really fun. Honestly, that's one piece that I, I miss that I wish I could hold on to. Um, when I, when my role shifted and I became the video guy, manager of video, whatever the heck my title was, um, we had a month to build a video system and that adapted and that changed as we went. But uh, initially, the, the person we were working with to kind of help was like, yeah, we're gonna buy uh, just Blackmagic ATEM and we're gonna get USB and use OBS and stream. And I was like, no, no, no. That's not how we're gonna roll, run this play. And so we ended up buying very, very nice fancy cameras um, and built a system uh, that uh, had some redundancy baked in, had, uh, I, I'm gonna talk about a practical video thing over here, but had at the end, but had a piece of gear that uh, I will not do a single video live streaming show ever again without this piece of gear. In fact, I have one sitting in my closet that I purchased that I use for some corporate gigs that I still do more on that in a moment. But uh, that was such a fun process. Uh, if you understand signal flow, starting to get into the bits and bobs and NDI and, and SDI and HDMI and conversion between those and video hubs and routing and, and ATEMs and connecting everything and connecting things in a way that's modular and gives you flexibility as opposed to just going, here's our system. That was so, so much fun. Number three for me, it was a fun combo of both technical and creative. So. Yes, yeah, so I, was, I was designing that system, which was really, really fun. It was a unique thing. I don't know that I'll ever be able to do that again, other than little video systems I'm designing for myself here and there. Um, but what was really fun about was that was the mix of technical and creative. There was this aspect of, and I always talk about those are the two most important skills that anyone kind of in live production has, and we should both work to grow each of them uh, at the same time. But um, along with building that system, I also led a team of volunteers. And we had some volunteers that were a little more technical and some a little more creative. And um, towards the beginning, I started to shift out of this because I wanted more volunteers doing this. But towards the beginning, I was both playing the role as director and often sometimes technical director. The person technical directing is technically pressing the buttons. The person directing is saying, take this shot, stand by, take two, whatever, that sort of thing. Um, I, I played both of those roles. And I loved it. I, I had never done that up until that point, but there was also a level of confidence I had that I knew I could do it because of these previous experiences being around it. I saw what worked. I saw what didn't. I've watched video before and I've understood when to switch cameras to cut to the beat. I've understood how to tell a story. Now I started to learn things from uh, some of the guys that were a part of the team that uh, were videographers and would help explain why not to cut from this shot to that shot or why to go from wide to tight or whatever, you know, how to, to, to layer those. They, they had more of the 
proper knowledge of that that helped inform things for me. But I had a really good, strong sense of like initially what to do uh, just based on my experience, which was really, really fun. So both the technical and creative, understanding how a switcher works and understanding how the switcher was connecting, uh, you know, the, the, the video, um, uh, not console, but uh, board uh, was connecting to the actual switcher over an ethernet cable using an IP address and how the video hub connected to the ATEM and the ATEM and video hub connected to the video recorders and how that got to the encoder. All those things were just so fun paired with there's something happening on stage and how do I visually represent that? Perfect example I'll share towards the beginning bit uh, of what we were doing. There was no one in the room with us. We were basically just a broadcast studio. So we had a, uh, a church building that was just a box, uh, essentially uh, kind of a gymnasium kind of thing. And uh, we had the stage and then there was really nothing in the actual room itself. So one, we moved all the cameras a lot closer to the stage. And then two, something I really strongly believe and have believed for a long time is the Marshall McLuhan saying, the medium is the message. And so um, I started working with a couple different pastors. In fact, uh, I was recording a, a message for a friend of mine that was gonna go then sh uh, send this to someone else to, uh, to play his message. And we tried this and he liked it. And so I suggested this to everyone else and they liked it. But I started to train, teach and train the, the speakers because we did this for some other things other than just church to treat the cameras as instruments, to treat them as people. And so our wide shot was when we talked to everyone. And then we had a tight shot on either side where I would tell them when you want to make a little more like personal statement, when you go from talking to us to talking to me personally, I want you to look at that camera. So instead of me driving them by saying stand by three, take three, they drove us. So as they would turn and we had some people that love messing with us. So they would turn and then come over here and we'd have to follow them but we were able to use technical to serve the goal of the creative. And, and that's a huge thing I walked away from is, you could say we have three cameras, so yeah, sure, wide, tight, this one, we can tell a story with that, but we actually were trying to tell a story and using technology to uh, tell a specific story. Another example of that is at one point, we had uh, people that were speaking pre-record at the very beginning of the whole like experience, the whole service, uh, a little blurb about what they were talking about. And they did that on their phone. And so we talked about it in our meeting. They said, well, make sure you turn your phone, you know, landscape to record it so that it, it looks great. And I don't remember if we accidentally got there, but at some point I kind of spoke up and, and said, hey, hey, instead of doing it horizontally, let's do it vertically because vertical feels more personal. Vertical feels more imperfect. And it's going to feel a little more like you're talking to me and you're just my buddy as opposed to a, a well-produced pre-service kind of thing that a lot of churches do and spend a lot of time and effort and money on. We just had people pick their phone up and record and talk. And, and because we understood me as the message, that was a really cool thing, which is really, really fun. Number four for me, it opened lots of doors. So um, quick stuff for me, and I won't run through all of this, but what was really crazy is I got that role. I started doing it. Um, someone who's the wife of our worship pastor, who's an author, uh, she, you know, she does a lot of different things. She had a book launch and she said, Hey, we want to do a virtual book launch. Can you come do this? And so me and a couple of my buddies did the virtual book launch for her and it went really, really well. We were definitely short staffed and I realized quickly afterwards, we need more people and it's kind of scrappy and, and, uh, you know, rough around the edges, but we did it and it worked and it was really, really fun. And we were able to do that because of our experience in creating experiences and services and knowing how they should flow and what we should talk about, and what we should do. We were able to do it because of my technical knowledge of the gear we would need to make that happen. And we we're able to do it because of my experience as someone who creates a lot of content, knows what, what works, knows what helps serve the person that's teaching, speaking, you know, whatever. Uh, and so we kind of brought all that together and created this really fun event. Well, what's really cool is at, at that event, there was someone who's a CEO of a company um, that was based in Austin and uh, she really liked what we did. And she just reached out to her team and said, hey, for our event, I want you to hire these guys. And the, the team kind of reached out and was like, we don't know what you guys did, but she's like ranting and raving and talking about how great it was that, uh, you know, what you guys did. Um, so we want to bring you in. And there was some hesitation, I know, with, I think, some creative people on their team and who are these people? Do they know what they're doing? Um, and uh, I did some Zoom calls with them and showed them, uh, you know, a couple things we could do. But more than that, just kind of explained my heart is like, I'm not just 
a tech person who's going to sit in the back of the room with my arms crossed, be mad at you because everything's last minute. I'm going to engage with you and help you like, you know, use these cameras and these tools to tell a really good story. And so built this great relationship with them, did a really successful virtual Zoom event. Um, and in the same week we did that, ended up doing a Zoom event for another corporate company in Austin, it's a financial services company um, that has developed into a multi-year relationship where I still do video stuff and streaming for them. In fact, just got back from San Antonio for an event with them. Um, none of those events, none of those opportunities would have happened if I go back to that conversation I was talking about where I had those two paths to take. I couldn't have just sat on my butt, arms crossed and done nothing. And then also gotten those gigs. I got those gigs because I took the, that, 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 that path that was a little, you know, it was paved, but it wasn't clearly paved. I had never really fully done that, but I knew I could. I, I stepped into that. I learned, um, just took the knowledge I have from other things to apply. And man, it just opened so many doors. And that was just a huge blessing to my family financially at that moment. It was a huge blessing creatively because again, it allowed me to work with companies to tell their story virtually over Zoom events. And you hear Zoom and uh, both of these two companies, bigger companies I worked with, um, these were events over Zoom that were like eight hour events over multiple days. And you hear that and go, that sounds awful, but we produced the hell out of these events. They were freaking awesome. They were so, so cool. Um, if anyone's interested, uh, maybe, you know, leave a comment or something. Maybe I'll share some pictures of behind the scenes stuff, multi-camera stuff we did. And uh, anyway, it was just really, really fun. Okay. I, I want to talk, um, uh, a couple more tips here and tricks here in a second. But if you like content like this, again, I don't always tell stories where I ramble and talk about being a video guy. Um, but if, if you're someone that likes using Ableton Live on stage, performing on stage with Ableton Live, uh, just learns, uh, enjoys learning a new skill set, benefiting from that, a community of folks. Consider subscribing to this. If you're watching on YouTube, hit the subscribe button, enable the bell icon. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, consider uh, leaving a rating and review. Um, and then most of all, consider sharing this with someone that you think would enjoy this content. Um, super grateful, thankful, and blessed that you're listening and watching. Now, number five, I'm gonna run through the rest of these pretty quickly. Um, this reinforced the, the importance of building modular and redundant systems. Um, I'll talk about a piece of gear that was essential when we built this, but I built a system to where input two on our switcher didn't always have to be the same thing. I built a system that allowed me to flex based on the needs. Oh, well, well we have two speakers instead of one. We have someone that wants to play a video instead of this. So we want video to come from, um, uh, you know, front of house as opposed to you building video locally. Um, we had a setup at one point where the person doing pro presenter in room pro presenter is like a lyric display software used by a lot of churches. Um, we had someone doing pro presenter for the room that was different from someone doing pro presenter for broadcast. And if you know pro presenter well, then you're going, but Will, don't you know about the ability to do, you know, uh, multiple looks for each thing and you could have done this slide and done that. And yes, that's great. And that's something we considered and it would have taken less volunteers. But what it allowed us to do is because we were modular, we built things in a way that we could adapt and flex is we were able to adapt and flex um, in, in ways that would not have been possible if we had one person doing that. Again, build a system in a way where we connect inputs to a hub. That hub then has outputs that go to different places, different sources, different destinations. And because we built things in a modular way, again, it, it was able to go where we needed it to go. We were able to flex and change as, a, as opposed to building. Uh, and here's a mistake I see, whether it's a playback rig, audio uh, install for a place, a video install for a place, video rig, in-ear monitor rig, is we tend to build rigs and scenarios and setups for our current needs and never consider our possible future needs. I understand that because money isn't infinite. Um, yes, you could take out multiple credit cards and max out your credit limit for everything and still not design the right system. But um, you build an in-ear system that works until you get an additional person and you build an in-ear system that works until you decide to start using tracks or you decide to use a different audio console. So building a system that's modular, that's redundant is the way to go. And that was super, super fun. Number six for me, learning about another skill set is always beneficial. I don't know if you're like me, but there's a... I think a certain type of person that's wired a certain way that loves behind the scene content. And I don't care what it is, I don't care what the thing is, but seeing the behind the scenes, seeing what it took to make something happen 
is something I'm always interested in. And I think it comes back to that desire to always learn, to keep learning. Um, uh, you know, again, learning more about how a, a broadcast service, multicam service is, is cut, is created, um, learning how to build a video system that's modular, learning how to create a virtual event, uh, learning how to tell a story through technology that you don't normally use is always beneficial. You're not gonna go do that and walk away and go, I'm gonna create crappier music now because I you know, switch video for something. I learned so, so much through that, which was, again, incredibly, incredibly beneficial. Number seven, I teased this earlier. I'm saying seven, I've swapped all these numbers around, so don't worry about numbers here. But another thing I learned is I get bored easily. Again, I teased this earlier, but it was really beneficial for me to be working from Studio Sage full time, um, running Ableton, uh, creating setups for people to help run Ableton, teaching and training folks how to use Ableton, running a business, but I get bored really easily. So it was incredibly beneficial for me to do something that was completely foreign from that. Um, and what was interesting, there was a lot of people that only knew me as Will the video guy. And they go, oh, Will, yeah, you're, you know, you're a video guy. And I'm like, well, no, I've actually run audio more than I've run video and I've taught Ableton more than I've done any of those things. And I've played guitar and been a musician longer than I've done any of that stuff, right? Um, and, and so that was really interesting to me that there were people like, oh, Will's the video guy or here's our video guy or whatever. And I'm like, I'm not a video guy. I don't, I don't know how lenses work. I barely understand frame rates, but um, I have a technical creative skill set that I can apply to kind of similar things. And um, I had so, so much fun. So if you get bored easily, if you're like me, then consider something that's like adjacent to what you do. If you're a playback tech, then consider, um, you know, doing some other production thing. If you're a playback tech um, or a musician, then consider being a playback tech. If you're, uh, you know, uh, someone that works in live music, consider doing something that's like producing music or being in a recording studio or being a monitor engineer, front of house audio engineer. Um, uh, the people that I know that are best at X also did something else professionally very, very well that benefits that thing. I know very few people that are amazing front of house audio engineers that don't have some sort of musical background. Um, uh, I'm sure they exist, but almost everyone I know, everyone I can think of that was a front of house audio engineer that's really good also played or currently plays music. Same thing with playback techs. I think you're gonna struggle as a playback tech as someone running Ableton for a band, in a band, for an artist, for yourself if you don't have some sort of musical knowledge or um, you're gonna struggle if you don't understand how a lighting console works. Again, you don't have to necessarily do it, but just understand those basic concepts. Okay, uh, let's get to three final things here. Uh, two of these are highly technical. Um, uh, one, uh, this, these are both ands. One, always use a video hub. Um, different companies make different things, basically a video routing device. Uh, I use uh, gear from Blackmagic, so let me see if I can pull up uh, pull up this. If you're watching on YouTube, you'll see this. Kind of in real time as I'm searching for this, we'll see if we can find it. Uh, so let me show you a Blackmagic Video Hub. I have a 20 by 20, which means 20 inputs, 20 outputs. It's essentially a router and or a patch bay that's programmable. Um, always, always design every single system you have with some sort of patch bay, some sort of rating thing. So a uh, routing thing. So here's what it looks like. This is the exact one I have right now, the 20 by 20. So you have 20 inputs, you have 20 outputs. What that means is, uh, particularly when I did those corporate gigs, I call this the CEO pleaser because I would have a stream deck. That sounds pretty inappropriate, but I'll, I'll move past it. I have a stream deck and on the stream deck, I programmed that for certain buttons to where uh, I think we had six uh, TVs and I would have a CEO or speaker get up and they would see the three TVs we'd have and they'd go, um, can you make this screen uh, previous slide, make this one next slide or make this current slide next slide and then make this all the Zoom comments. And without going up to the TVs to change a cable, I'd go to my stream deck and I'd go monitor one, boom, source one, monitor two, source two, monitor three, source three. And I would change it instantly and I would save a preset that would recall that. And, and to a person, every single one of them went, wow, that's amazing. And I can almost guarantee that a lot of the gigs I had, I continued to get. And the, the referrals that I got from those companies continued because I had this one piece of gear. I had this single piece of gear 
that allowed for flexibility. So when you're creating a system, again, that's why I teach the three-part framework for using tracks. That's why I use tracks the way I do is it's all about flexibility. It's all about modularity. It's all about being able to change things live in the moment. And uh, a video hub is an essential skill. Again, there's other companies that make this. So if you're like, ooh, why do you use Blackmagic? You should use Ross video stuff. What you do, you baby, like whatever you want, you buy it, but buy a video matrix routing thing. Okay. Uh, the tail end of that, that I learned is it's never the video hub. If you have something going wrong, I can't tell you the amount of times where someone said, Oh, what's well, the video hub all. And this is highly technical to video stuff. So if you're not a video person, ignore this, but, um, every single time that happens, someone would say, Oh, it's the video hub. And I would tell them, all the video hub does is accept inputs and sends out outputs. It does zero conversion, at least the particular ones I, I had and used. It does zero conversion. Whatever you, you send it, it will then send out to something else. And so the first couple of times I would appease people and we'd reboot it. But then every time after that, I'd say, it ain't the video hub. So let's move on to our next thing because um, it ain't the video hub. Uh, another uh video specific hack thing that you need to know is buy a decimator. Decimator, if you've... Um, Let's see if we can pull these up again really quickly. Uh, you've seen these if you've been in the video world at all whatsoever. Decimator is this little red box that's a conversion tool. It's also a splitter. So like it's one in, multiple outs. Um, this is their site. You, you've seen this thing. This is a, a version of that. Uh, but if you go to, let's see, not multi viewers. I guess it would be mini converters here. Um, but these little red decimators, this, this, uh, thing in particular, this one, the MDHX, they have a 4K version as well too. This guy has saved my bacon more times than I can count. Um, uh, basically you can plug anything into it. If you're doing video stuff, any type of computer you connect to your system needs to hit a decimator before it hits and goes elsewhere. It's gonna make every single thing work. Almost every monitor, if you have some sort of weird frame rate conversion thing, the decimator is going to work. It's going to split stuff, convert HDMI to SDI. You know, you see the little black magic converters. And another bonus thing is never buy the knockoff black magic converters, always buy the black magic converters because they will never work. Another bonus tip is never buy the cheap little, um, uh, uh, HDMI, SDMI to ethernet adapters on Amazon. None of them work. Use NDI if you're going over ethernet. Otherwise, well, let's take you to my last tip here in a second, but buy a decimator. Uh, in fact, a lot of gigs, um, this is a pro tip. A lot of gigs when I know I'm interfacing with video people as a playback person, I show up and I have a decimator in my rig. And that's just kind of that, like, you know, if you've ever driven a Jeep, my dad has an old Jeep. You kind of know that everyone you're driving, you kind of, everyone does the the hand or the nod or the wink to the, the, the Jeep drivers. Cause you're like, we're in the club together. It's kind of the same thing. You show up with a decimator and the video people will go, huh. Oh. Uh, that guy, that girl, they know what they're talking about. I'm going to help them out here. They're, they're one of us. Um, final tip here. I've gone way too long, but this has been really fun for me. To, to me, this is all about remembering and celebrating the season. And so a uh, final thing for me is avoid hacks. Use what works. What I mean by that is when you get into video world, in particular the streaming world, there's a lot of people that um, do a lot of hacky things. They have Ableton on their computer and they run OBS, Ecamm, Wirecast on their computer. And then they do these little apps to then route audio from here to there. And they have to stand on one foot and, and hold their hand behind their back and uh, cross their fingers and hope that things work. I often say hope is not a good backup plan. Uh, wishing, hoping that something works as opposed to doing the work to confirm that it does in fact work. Um, uh, hope is not a good backup plan. So what I learned is when I would design and build systems, I, I say all those things I said before about, you know, HDMI, SCI to ethernet stuff. I say that because I did gigs where I use those and they didn't work. And I, I, I bought the cheap adapters, converters, hoping they would work and they didn't work. So the best hack is to buy it right the first time and, and design a system that you know will work. Don't rely on wireless to to send midi from your computer to control pro presenter or resolume use a wired cable do what works for me in video world it meant we're going to have a hardware switcher we're going to use sdi cables to run long, long distances um, occasionally and a couple times we would use ndi particularly from pro presenter for a current and previous slide we'd set that up um, but we didn't use hacks we didn't put a lot of stress on a computer by doing lots of different things. And there were things I messed up. There were times that ProPresenter lyrics wouldn't work and that's partially because ProPresenter is 
ProPresenter. Um, so a lot of it was user error. Uh, a lot of it was just different things, trying to get the key to work, to understand the little black magic box that would give us our appropriate signal. But um, avoid hacks and use what works. Okay, I've gone 30 minutes, and this is way longer than I intended to. Um, but thanks for letting me do this, whether you're still watching or not. Uh, again, this was all about celebrating the season and looking back at a season and go, this is what I learned because I learned a lot of this. So if anything, this is documented for me as, as kind of a, a, a path along the way in Ebenezer to look back to, to uh, remember joyfully. And uh, man, it was a lot of fun. So um, whatever you're doing, whatever opportunities you have when you have those two paths, take the one that's going to be a little more work. Take the one you're a little unsure of because every time in my life I've done that, man, it's paid off immensely and it's way better than taking the easy comfortable path um what does ryan holiday say that the stoics say obstacle is a way right so take that particular path um, but one of the best things you could do that's actually not very difficult to do shameless plug hit the subscribe button enable the bell icon you'll see exactly when i go live if you're watching listening on spotify uh, apple podcasts and do me a favor leave a rating or review um, thanks so much for watching uh, leave a comment. Let me know what stood out to you most, uh, what impacted you the most, what you're taking to heart, or maybe share a story where you stepped and took that, that harder path and learned something really cool. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week where we will not talk about video stuff. Take care, everybody. Bye.